Welcome to the Agile People FikaCast. We talk about how to navigate with agility in our organizations. So we think you are the expert. <laughs> Is that what you meant by expert? <laughs> it's been a long time since well don't get me wrong I, the majority of my career has been, still been in finance it's just that i chose not to just be an accountant um you know um, and, and unfortunately my wife is an accountant but so i vicariously live still live that that um um accounting thing through her because she has month in she has period in she's year then she has the auditors coming. All those things that are scary to an accountant, you know, those milestones of inefficiency, you know, and I just and it just it just makes my heart weep when I I listen to her talk about the same. So if I think I was an accountant twenty five years ago, and I, I'm thinking, why are you still doing this? Seriously, seriously. <laughs> 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 so she goes, "Oh, shut up! I know you don't want to be an accountant." I was like, "No, there's there's good there's good reason as well." Uh, you know, it's um, yeah, yeah, it's 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 interesting because you remember from the podcast with uh, um, Richard, you know, they they explained the the history of the budget, which I thought was uh, interesting because it's really the same. Uh, we try to improve traditional thinking instead of thinking new uh, which is the same in management and leadership no absolutely and and they do this they do the same thing in budgeting as they do in leadership as well they think mm -hmm. putting the tools in place that makes the the budget look nice and shiny and uh, and whatever but still follow the same practice of how they compile it you mm -hmm. know it's um after the after the call, I tried to get my wife to see a different, um, but she was firm on the traditions of budget setting. I was like, okay, see <laughs> <laughs> <Very> hard. <laughs> you you have no idea how sometimes um, the smallest thing, particularly around finance, is not the most sexy of subjects in, in its own right, but um, the um, the fighting that can go with it because people are so held on to those traditional values. And as we see, I mean, this is this is the exasperation for, for yourself, Pia Maria, is that you found that in HR, you know, and 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 it's it's just so debilitating watching people just firmly grasp onto this like it's five hundred years of history that we must maintain. There's like Yeah. Okay, just take five minutes to kind of think you could do something <laughs> different and better. But the thing is that humans are very good at adding on things to problems. So yeah, yeah. we solve problems by adding something new. We don't remove things. So when we want, when we yeah. think so needs to be, that's sort of the human behavior. I Absolutely. think I would guess that 90% of all humans are behaving that way most of the time. Of course, we can all do it in some small things, but especially the things that we feel very strongly for maybe it's harder to actually remove yeah. things for yeah, well, you need absolutely. as you said invest some brain capacity or in time to actually mm. see and do those things if you want to really change something i guess you need to see that better alternative don't you have it's you know something to place it because otherwise if you take that that one thing away from them and they've got nothing else, then they, they, you know, they're immediately feeling, well, I feel now worthless. I feel my job's at, yeah. at risk. I feel that my my whole being is being exposed, you know? Mm. Um, because I've been, when I sort of flipped to become a, con a consultant, I was still going into sort of finance organizations or finance teams, and they would still be there with these, like, you know, coffee-stained, dog-eared, instructions of how to do something and they they couldn't nine times out of ten they couldn't tell you what it was that they were doing and why they were doing it it was just it was given to them and they just followed it blindly and i said to them i used to say to them now i could say this without risk and stuff like that say listen see this month end don't do that don't do that see see who screams after you don't do it 
and then I next did. month you know you know you could <laughs> correct it no nobody was brave enough to 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 do it but I, I thought you know what you, you continue doing something that you've got no understanding of what it is that you're doing yeah. I did that one I was working it was HR though but it was reporting so yeah. I uh, it was yeah. 120,000 employees around the globe. And uh, then I stopped sending some reports. <laughs> they <Yeah>. didn't notice <laughs> for several months. Yeah. But when they noticed, they checked every month. <laughs> <laughs> we, we use... It took a change in that. Maybe you were sidetracking from the subject, but it's still it's behavioral change. In a, in a company, it was 200 employees or something like that. It's not very big. But we decided to cancel, remove all meetings across teams, uh, across the, in, just to see which one hurt not having. Mm. So and we took that and we made that we continued that for four weeks or something. And then people started mm. to feel that things are, were hurting. And we, we want this one back or we want this part of this meeting back. Mm. And it was sort of a uh, rebirth of what was good and the removal of what was bad. You know, sometimes you have to shock the change, don't you? Mm. Um you know, it's you, 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 sometimes the gentle, the gentle approach is, is um, it's, doesn't have the legs. It's um, sometimes you just have to shock it, and disrupt completely. Um, my last company, which was a big investment company, I, <laughs> I did write this case study, which I called the case for positive disruption in finance. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Everybody liked the idea, and they were like, "Yeah, go ahead, David. You do it. You, you know." We, we'll 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 follow behind you and stuff like that. I was like, no, no, I kind of need you to kind of come alongside me. And it's and it's funny this this company and they're a big organization, and they um they categorically told me that oh David we were we're not we're a big traditional organization. Um, you know, even five years ago we operated like Gordon Gecko. You know, and and um. And Wall Street and stuff like that, where they where the guys would still have the the red braces and the striped shirts and the slick back hair and all this sort of stuff. You know, the real bully boys. It was a real um boys' club and stuff. And I was like, all oh, right, okay. So and they weren't they weren't so, oh coming to Agile, oh, that's that's just we're we're nowhere near that. And it's um and I thought, yeah, you're not that. But we, in terms of uh, my team, they practiced Agile. And they were like, David, you you can do Scrum, uh, Scrum Master. I'm like, well, I, I can. Um, that's not to say I'm going to do it. But, you know, oh, could you do a retrospective for us? They're like, yeah, no problem. We can do that. I said, when, when was the last time you did a retrospective? Um, eight months ago. I was like, okay, you're not Agile, <laughs> really. Seriously. <laughs> You can't even do that. And so the the funny thing is, when I got um, so I joined Helgi's book club the other week there, and you know the age of agile with um, yeah. Um, sorry, what's his name? Denning. Uh, Stephen Denning. Stephen. Stephen. Stephen Denning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Got so many books to read. <laughs> Just, I can't remember. <laughs> I, I, I know that you know them all personally, but you know, it's <laughs> um. So I was reading that, and it, and. It started off in the early chapters and says, the two most agile organizations in the world is this. And I was like, no, they're not. They really are not. Because one of them is the one I was at um, <laughs> the last year. I was like, not a chance that are you even considering yourself agile. Even you admit yourself you're not agile. And then another one that Helgi brought up was Barclays Bank. Now, Barclays Bank used to be my business account um, for my company. And um, and again, <laughs> you know, you know the device, you know the device that you have online that you can go and check your account there. Um, it's a little calculator thing. I had that around somewhere, and then um, it took them eight weeks for them. Sorry, it took them a, a year and eight weeks for them to get me a new one that worked. So was... let us have a look a bit on the subject today. Yes, uh, yes. Sorry, I didn't want to stop you because uh, we we had we had good things. But we're, today's subject it's about the drawbacks of having overly specific financial objectives, and sometimes it might be good 
we prepared ourselves before this week and we talked about McDonald's and uh, in that production line, maybe it's really good to have uh, quite specific uh, uh, financial objectives. Uh, my experience, in, experience from working in IT, where you have operational costs and you have development costs, and uh, sometimes someone says uh, from far, far away, yeah, we have too much operational cost. We need to lower the operational cost, but they are not looking into the actual reality of that product that is living. It might be that there's a lot of technical depth connected to that uh, product, and therefore we have a lot of uh, uh, operational cost. So we cannot just remove uh, or lower the operational cost by just cutting the budget. Because what happened in that situation, people just started the time report in a different way, and they continue to do the work that brought more, most value to, pro to the product. But it was really important to lower that cost, and uh, they got it, but it was a bit too specific, and it was too far away from the reality. Mm. <laughs> I mean, what you want is the most bang for the buck, right? Of course, uh, it's not is not definitely. I mean, always lowering uh, cost, but uh, uh, maybe you should increase cost, and then you will get more bang for the buck. Uh, mm -hmm. Who knows? Maybe you start creating so much value that you become so profitable that it doesn't matter what your cost is. <laughs> mm -hmm. You need to right. try it, you know. Yeah. Well, I guess it's about the optimizing the cost itself, though. You know, mm -hmm. there is an awful lot of sort of duplication and wasted effort that goes into, you know, the spending of things. You know, as, so as you cost a product or, or materials and stuff like that, you know, so it's about looking at that and saying, listen, the cost bit is we can't change that. What we need to do is make that cost more efficient in the way that we we handle it. You know, you get into the the whole kind of just in time in terms of material handling. You get into looking at the the sort of value stream in terms of the efforts that go into to you know um, managing that spend. Yeah. You know, the the time involved. Mm -hmm. Who does it labor? Um, you know, how many hands does it go through? How many texts does it need to go through? um as well so it's 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 about looking at that and you know an awful lot of companies will will sort of look to address that but again it comes down to you know if you start trying to shave off departments of of eyes looking at it and approval levels and all this sort of stuff then you know again people feel their jobs at risk or their their, their capability has been lessened and stuff. So, so, but it's ultimately, you know, if you, you paint the picture, it's about optimizing cost, then, mm. and, and particularly in public sector organizations where it's very key mm. on because it's the public purse that you're spending for, you know, very noticeable services, um, you know, social care, housing, um, et cetera, et cetera, as well. Yeah, but you can flip it equally on private sector and financial services that um, as much as they're more revenue generated, um, yeah, I mean, optimizing mm. cost is always a good thing as well, you know. So. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But uh, a very good way of optimizing cost is to remove uh, managers, right? Because uh, <laughs> everybody mm. will get more. Their salaries are actually maybe the biggest cost of, of any business. And that's what they did at Morningstar, right? So they removed mm. all the managers and then everybody could have more salary of everybody who was actually creating value because managers sell mm. and create that much value. Um, they are not kind of the most value creating um, units of a company. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, their argument yeah, is always then, that, mm. that their argument is always that if you remove that layer then you you know that you increase the risk, you know. So, oh, but but yeah, course. obviously a, a company like Morningstar works yeah. better effectively and dispels that rumor. So maybe maybe it is about instead of trying to get all the the larger type organizations to jump at this, you know, maybe the the medium ones that are the the sort of key ones that oh. that that prove that this can work, you know. And mm. so, uh... Martin, you did some research before the today's week about. Um, uh, Things that could happen in an organization if you are overly specific on the financial targets. 
So uh, what did you find there? I always go back to, to Ken Evin when I'm thinking about anything. <laughs> and that's my looking glass. <laughs> uh, that's how I, I understand the world. And I think if you're overly specific in your financial objectives, you are creating hard constraints to any organization. You, you sort of make the impact of not reaching these objectives uh, catastrophical more or less they they break in such a hard way so it's hard for things people to not trying to reach them and then people i think people start to gain them uh in different ways uh so i think uh, that is a big risk if you make them overly specific uh, people start to gain them, start to try to find ways to approach them, um, which is, yeah, makes you very short-sighted. It, it, it uh, nourishes the short-term short -term behaviors and mm. bad, bad behaviors as well, like competition and brown nosing and politics and all these bad behaviors that we see in organizations mm. because everybody needs to we that specific detail target that they have set to get their reward and so on. But now we're going to the performance management part. But, yeah. yeah, but it's very connected. It Especially is. to managers, yeah. the financial goals are uh, usually connected to performance goal for a manager. And uh, uh, it, I have seen several times that uh, managers tend to do counterproductive things just to fulfill their financial goals and with that their performance goals because they are measured on that they uh, yeah they are measured on it so they uh, uh, if they fulfill the budget then they will get more bonus end of the year yes. more or less and it feels and, good uh, to things you you i, I have exercises uh, where we, we can try, people try to, if you follow, follow this checklist, people are very good at following checklists because it's easy. You, you start to do that and then you stop to think because there's a checklist of things you need to do. Uh, uh, right. Overly specific things feels like a checklist, I think. So just want, if I reach this, then I'm done. Mm. I don't have the possibility to reflect and think about the things. I'm just doing mm. stuff. Yeah. And and finance people like that. They like the order of things. But the, the problem I see that, um, Martin, is that people go down a checklist and, and just ticking it off as, the, as they perform it. And what, what the bit that they miss doing is the holistic view of, so what is the, the overall impact of me doing this? That's fine of me mechanically going through these steps and, and hey, that feels like a win. But if if I think about my budget setting days, we would do the whole scientific thing, going down the list of, you know, here's the costs, here's the revenues, here's, you know, individual and um, departmental costs, et cetera, et cetera. And so you do the scientific of applying, you know, 10% here, 5% uplift here, et cetera, et cetera. And you've got various tools that allow you to do that much more quickly these days. But what generally managers will do, you hand it back to them and say, oh, actually, that looks too high or that looks too low. And just without rhyme or reason or appearing rhyme or reason, it will say, can you change that? Can you add 100,000 to that? And go, why? Because the way that he looks at it, because he's not involved in the mechanics of um, compiling it, he just wants to see that his bottom line looks good. Because as you mentioned there, Daniel, his budget is, is sort of his um, performance and um, bonus is is measured on that and you know yeah. and that alone and so there's so you as the the person compiling the budget no holistic view the guy who is going to sign off the budget no holistic view and so everybody has these little carvings of 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 their view of the world and it's um and and, and as you mentioned it starts to create some unsavory behaviors shall we say mm -hmm. ethical fading and all that sort of stuff you know it's um um and that that combined with the budget setting process is always done very um rushed at a period when you'd much rather be doing or sorry you you need to be doing something else so that year-end closing 
you know the the corporate reporting your sort of um you know wider or regulatory type reporting capability as well this is this is all kind of all mismatched together and from when you look at all the finance staff they're all stressed out trying to compile that yeah and always at the end or it starts in august somewhere september and you need to create set the budget for the next year and there's a lot of rush and everyone is just yeah we need to just fix the budget we need to set everything and you need so everything needs to be in place and then it, everyone after needs to clear it and blah 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 there's mm-hmm. so many steps mm-hmm. just because but you know you're important we are approaching you're going to a, a budget year. meeting you're an important person and that's why they keep this ritual <laughs> because yes we are doing the rain dance it doesn't make it rain but you know it feels good to do it yeah <laughs> you have to be seen to be doing it absolutely yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a ritual uh, that makes people important. But you had an example there, Pia, I think, about, about the fishermen and, and the fiscal year and the challenges that... I oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That. yeah because the, the, there was the, the fishermen and the accountant. This is a story from Gatta Business. And, and the, uh, the fisherman says, yeah, he's telling the, the accountant, yeah, I'm, I'm fishing for five months and then I have five months off. What is the accountant's question? then to the fisherman it's what do you do the rest of the two months that's left of this year and he, because this is the rhythm of his fishing is five months it's not a full year but many times you focus just on a calendar year but why do we focus on a calendar year i mean the business rhythm has nothing to do with the, the accounting as such it, it's two separate things really so every business has its rhythm and it's not always the same as a calendar year. We don't need it to be a calendar year either. You, you have the HR wheel, same thing. It's a calendar year. You do this wow. from this time of year, that, that time of year, and so on and so on. <laughs> but why? Shouldn't we do it as often as we, we can or want to or find feasible instead of just following a kind of predefined structure of an HR wheel. Um, yeah, so so we're governed by the wrong things, in this case, the annual mm-hmm. thing mm-hmm. that, uh, because there is a law uh, in, um, and, uh, and the legal aspect to it that you need to, to give the, uh, close the books and so on every year. Yeah, and all they yes. sort of awesome. said that we should do it and it's hard for us too step away and remove behaviors that we have already set mm-hmm. we can add things to on top of it but we don't we are not good at removing behaviors no thank you uh, i think so, it's good uh, that we I, start... I so, sorry uh thank you i just want to say that it's good that we turn it around a bit because uh, you started now uh Pia Mia. Uh, we uh, at Andial People, we have understood that both HR and finance are two big enablers for an Agile organization. We need to have them on board. Uh, we have a training uh, today. It will be launched uh, this month. Uh, it, and uh, it's about uh, Agile finance. Uh, so it's uh, created by Agile People and Beyond Budgeting. Uh, so so I... Since we already started there, I would like to use the last minutes to bit talk about what is it that Beyond Budgeting then is saying, and how can we connect that to uh, to the to today's uh, subject about financial mm. objectives. Mm. So the first thing is to break the link between annual budgets, fixed mm. performance targets, and bonuses and rewards. So break that link so that. We don't link people's targets uh, to the budgets and to rewards because then people will just try to reach the targets because they get the reward, not because they really want to, you know, go in that direction or stretch themselves. And then there are there are also three purposes of of the the budget. It's the target setting, and and that is maybe what we would like to happen. And this is usually what you use as your budget figure, what you would like to happen. But then there, you need also to make a, a forecast regarding what you think will happen. And these are two different numbers. And then there is the uh, the third number that you need to keep separate from the previous two is 
the resource allocation. It should be dynamic instead of decided in advance because there may be things turning up in the middle of the year that we didn't see coming, right? When the, we live in this complex reality that is changing all the time, we need to all the time be uh, on the outlook for new possibilities and new benefits that could serve us instead of being tied by um, by a fixed annual budget. So instead, open the bank the whole year instead of having it just open in the autumn when you do the budget. Um, that's some of the things that we learn in, in this training and a lot mm -hmm. of exercises, of course, and discussions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting, and I think Daniel made the point there, Premier, that um, um, that um, HR and finance are in that position of of being able to be that the key enablers, and I think maybe a half step that needs to happen there then that HR and finance need to find some way of joining forces, because mm -hmm. you know this and and, and I know this is that the, these guys very rarely speak to each other, and if they do, it's never really on the, the same terms. And so the the kind of if if it has to be a joint force, and I'm not saying that it has to be, but if it's if it's a way of moving things forward, um, yeah, maybe, maybe joining forces would be a, at least a good thing, or at least allies. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. so I'm, I'm looking forward to the training actually. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to join us? I'm hoping to um, pay money. Yes, I have. I've not signed up just yet, but um, um, I'm. Wait. Yeah, but, but yeah. yeah, I'm hopeful. Yeah. Yeah. I'm waiting on a big. Has it been finalised in terms of location and stuff like that? Yeah. Okay, so now it's going to be in, uh, in Stockholm. Yeah. Mm. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I with that, check the weather uh, before I come. So with that, yep. uh, let's end uh, today's fika and thank you for attending. Mm -hmm.